Welcome to Colors Over Crutch Deck Techs. My name is Max Nurberg, also known as Wounded Satellite, also known as your kindly lord, and I'm joined by the most incredible co-host there ever was, Max P, the Italian man. And guess what? Today, we are going over the deck that I most recently just conquered a tournament with, and the deck that Max P top 16 one of the largest events in history with, Italian, aka waterboarding is back, baby. <laughs> Yeah, what's up, guys? A lot of people have been lo looking for this, so he here we're doing it. We're finally doing it. We're going to take you through Talion. We're going to talk about how the deck works. We're going to talk about the cards in it. We're going to talk about everything about Talion and why it's great or why you should or shouldn't play it, frankly. To that end, let's just jump right into some of the history of Talion. Talion was originally spoiled Wilds of Eldraine really, really early. Uh, before anything else from the set came out, back in July of 2023, and people jumped right on it. Uh, the first person to really get excited about Italian, I think, was actually Memo. So shout out to Memo. Memo put out a tweet at some point where he's like, this card looks amazing, isn't this better than Nimrus? And me, boneheaded, didn't read the whole card, responded back, nah, I think Nimrus is better. <laughs> Which is hilarious in retrospect. So long before the set actually came out, uh, Memo had built a deck around Talion. Uh, that original deck was sort of built around a bit of a uh, Opus Thief type concept. Lots of wheels, Shieldred, Bowmasters. Uh, he was running Blood Chief's Ascension at that point, although I don't think at that point we realized exactly how good it was. But that, that was the first iteration of Talion, so credit to Memo for that. I followed immediately after in August, and I actually had a paper version of the deck already built when I went to... Festival of Nights in August. Even before it was available as a card, I had it printed out and was, was messing around with it. At that point, Comedian uh, picked up on it, thought it was cool, and did a deck tech video himself on the earliest version of the deck. And then right as that was happening, Max and I decided, let's start collaborating on this thing, and we started working on it together. Fast forward. You know, I also... Mm -hmm. Go on. I also had a version of Talion before I officially had one. My my artist here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> Fast forward, here we are. God, what are we? February, bro. How many months ago? Oh, so, August, six months. So right six, months, six months. So six months. Right about yeah. six months. So it took yeah. us six months to really mature the deck completely. Uh, I played a, a an early version of it in a, a chaos tournament, and it did not do well. You know, I did not at that point. You know, talk about learning curve. I was not ready to play the deck yet. The deck was not mature enough yet. It, it took a, a little bit longer before I think it was really ready. But in November of last year, at the largest CDH event in North America at that point, I believe, was Top Deck Expo. And I ran Talion there and came in eighth place. So that was the first, I, in my opinion, like first real result with this version of the deck. Uh, felt great. And then fast forward to this month where Mr. Sternberg here uh, took the whole thing down, one one chaos uh, Treasure Series 11 with, with our deck. And when we say this version of the deck, when you look at the various other Italian lists that some people have had some level of success with, there are a lot of, I'd almost say like Brewer's Advantage cards thrown into them. They're on lots of things like Praetor's Grass. Sometimes, you know, they're on Brain Freeze to try and steal a Breach. These very interesting kind of different takes on win lines that are not any of the strategies that we're trying to go for. We are very all in on the pure control. Yes. The pure control and the trust that grind, trust that clean play. You're not trying to cheese out anything. Like everything is hard earned. Yeah. And, and to that end, you're going to hear us say certain things over and over and over again. Uh, you know, one of those things is, you know, this deck is not easy. This deck has a very very steep learning curve uh, and when you first pick up the deck and you first try to play it you're gonna struggle we all struggled with it i struggled with it even max struggled with it at times you know getting you know understanding you know some of the nuances of how to play this deck number one and you'll hear us say this probably 45 times throughout this video italian is not a stack deck. this is not a stack deck. this is a control deck we utilize stacks pieces but we utilize them as ways to hedge our interaction, to make our interaction more effective. And you'll find that a lot of our stacks pieces double as interaction, and a lot of our interaction doubles as stacks. A really important concept when looking at stacks versus control is that philosophically, the whole theory of a stacks deck is you are taking away your opponent's ability to play the game. When you are playing a systematic tempo control deck, you are just trying to disrupt your opponent's ability to win the game. 
As you will also hear us say multiple times, we are a deck that is naturally rewarded by our opponents taking game actions. We do not want them to think I can't play the game and do nothing. We want them to take game actions. We want them to keep giving us triggers from those game actions, which allows us to really just continue our grip, continue our control, continue to disrupt the win lines and eventually present our own really confident. Yes, agreed. And with that in mind, you know, in my mind, there's basically uh, three sort of steps in the process of learning to play Italian uh, effectively. The first is, uh, number one, learn to not be the police at the table. The objective of Italian is not to sit there and interact with every spell that gets put on the stack. You don't want to be the only one interacting. You don't want to be you know, stuffed into that role and pigeonholed into that role. Because if you do, what's going to happen repeatedly is someone's going to go for a win. You're going to stop them and the next player is going to win and you're going to lose. So getting to the point where you're forcing the whole table to play together, forcing everyone to play uh, their interaction as well as yours, that's step one. Step two is learning to interact extremely effectively, right? Learning to interact only at the right times and not waste your interaction for nothing. On, on that same note, it's important to be able to hypothesize into the future and recognize which things present enough value to essentially be win conditions. So when I'm playing a deck like Talion, I am more likely to counter a one ring on this deck than most other decks because I am more likely to make the game last for many, many turns. And so cards like that, that gain continuous, you know, almost exponential advantage as the game goes on, you do have to be aware of that because even though they don't present immediate threats to winning the game, in your normal strategy that you hypothesize out of the game going longer, they become game-winning threats. Yes, yes, agreed. Uh, and then the third piece is one of the things that most people complain about with Talion is learning to win with Talion and learning not only, you know, what the win lines are, but learning how to set up for them early. Because unlike other decks where you seize a window, you play one card and boom, you're off to the races. Italian requires a lot more setup to win games, uh, which is okay because we're designed to last longer. We're designed to have the ability to do those setups ahead of time. So, but, but that's an, another important piece of the learning process. Uh, initially, once you get over the part where you're not the police anymore, you're learning how to interact effectively, you're able to stop people from winning, you're going to find that there's a lot of games that just go to draw, go to draw over and over and over again. It gets frustrating. You're like, damn, this deck can't win. I mean, I've been there. I've talked to people about it. But you will get over that hump as you learn the deck, and you will find that you can win extremely well uh, without going to time. It can be done. You just have to learn how to do it so in breaking down the deck i think the first thing that we're going to do is put aside winning for now let's not talk about winning let's not talk about win lines let's talk about the the pace of the game how to play tempo how to interact you know the different types of interaction yeah and what you'll notice is our interaction exists within every single card type of this deck it is either obtaining us more interaction or being interaction in some way itself starting with planeswalkers we have karn the great creator a one-sided null rod that's incredible if you look at our creature base subtleties interaction gilded drake is interaction bowmasters is interaction spell Skite is a stacks piece of protection and interaction opposition agents interaction hallbreaker horror can work as just bounce spells i have used it for tempo as interaction you know the ability to Limit people's amount of card draw with something like Shoulder. It still functions as interaction. Clone effects can be interaction. Tashana's is interaction. If you look at our sorcery package, it's a little more niche. It's mostly tutors, but you do still get a Toxic Deluge that can function as interaction. Time Twister can still get rid of graveyards and function as interaction. Obviously, every single thing you see in the instance package, if it's not a tutor, all of these are interaction with a incredibly deep counter spell package, several pieces of onboard removal, the types of interaction that encompass every single win line in the format. I don't think there is anything that fully gets around what we have. We have something that can deal with anything. Going as into our artifacts, you know, it works in the same way. We have stacks pieces that can function like interaction, whether it's clone effects with imposter mech or stacks pieces like curse totem, weather runes, or graph diggers cage. They disallow our opponents from doing certain things, allowing the game to go longer, allowing us to tighten our grip. Going into enchantments, similar to Shieldred, giving people a clock that limits their capabilities of what they can do. Blood Chiefs forms a uh, fills a very similar role. Counterbalance. This is the best counterbalance deck in the format. The ability to put no additional resource into changing the top and just say, Talion trigger, counterbalance trigger, reveal from counterbalance, draw the card, the top is new again. It's it's incredible what this deck can do with that strategy. Dress down, obviously incredible interaction. It goes deeper as well when we even get into our land base. You see lands like Cabal Pit and Cephaly Coliseum. We use a lot of interaction in this deck and it's normally not that hard to get our 
graveyard to a point of activating threshold, which means we are able to snipe people's creatures with stuff like Cabal Pit, or we can even protect our own things with stuff like Plaza of Heroes to get around our opponent's interaction. The deck is very deep with its capabilities to interact. It, it, it can hit every single strategy or win line or aspect of the meta. We have something that fights against anything, and we have something that beats everything. Yep. It's very important to know which things work in certain scenarios, and it's very important to be able to hypothesize your opponent's win lines and what they are about to do to recognize if the moment you think you should interact right away is actually your best point of interaction. Um, we can get a little bit more into play lines soon, but like a really important thing to recognize is all of these cards are one for ones. So being able to recognize that your opponent is going to be tutoring for an underworld breach and waiting until they put that breach on the on the stack to use your spell snare and get them to use multiple cards to get there allows your one for one counter spell to function like a multiple. Yeah, and one of, one of the other things that's really cool about the the interaction suite in this deck, uh, and this is something that we're really proud of, is that a lot of these interaction pieces are very niche and, and atypical. They're not the, the same interaction package you see in like Blue Farm, for example. Yeah, we have some of the same counter spells, but we have a lot of things in addition to that that frankly our opponents are not used to seeing. And they, they function in two ways. One, they let us interact at different points in opponents' lines or gameplay. And two, it also allows us to honestly say to the table, I don't have anything for that, right? So they're, they're doing something they're playing a, a card that we know is going to lead into a whole strategy for them. And our opponents are looking to us to play police. And at that point, we can push that off and tell them, sorry, I cannot interact at this point. At which point they have to decide, are they going to let this happen or are they going to step in and interact? And most of the time, you know, they're going to step in and interact because they don't want to lose the game. Uh, but we could sit back, you know, bide our time and jump in at exactly the right moment to disrupt whole lines instead of trying to interrupt individual cards. So examples of that in terms of niche interaction. So you already mentioned one of them, Spell Snare. I don't think people realize how great Spell Snare is in the current meta. Almost every win strategy that, that's out there right now is a two mana spell. You've got Underworld Breach. Mm -hmm. You've got Thassa's Oracle. Dockside, Grand Abolisher. Yeah, Dockside, Grand Abolisher, exactly. You know, Spell Snare hits exactly what, it, what we want it to hit. It doesn't need to hit a value engine. We want it to hit the payoff. We want it to hit the win line and we can sit back and let other things happen again because we don't want to stop our opponents from playing we want them to play because the more they play the more we draw the more they die one of the more important philosophies to get down when you're talking about a tempo control deck is resource management and how your resource management changes based on what card advantage access you have as well as how your cards can be used more effectively than others so we said shortly how spell snare can function as a multiple for one if you know the last thing in a line is going to be a breach and so you don't have to care about the other things that you otherwise might feel like you have to deal with um, it's important to recognize that most pieces of instant speed stack based interaction are one for ones there are exceptions with stuff like my break trap and fluster storm but if you cast your underwear breach just randomly and I spell snare it, that functions as a one for one. Uh, static interaction, things that are on board and continuous tend to be far better resource management. When you're looking at things like Graft Digger's Cage, Curse Totem, Weathered Runestone, Opposition Agent, all of these effects function a lot better. As an example, if someone casts a tutor and you use Opposition Agent to stop that tutor, you have one for one to that tutor. In, in some essence, you've two for one it because you also gained a card. But if your collective other three opponents have four more tutors in hand, that Opposition Agent has now functioned as a five or six for one. So these pieces of static interaction can be very, very important to get down because they allow you to sit back and hold your stack interaction for a longer period of time, which functions as better resource management. On the same topic of tempo control, you'll notice that part of the reason we can play this incredibly deep package of counter magic is because we have really, really good card advantage in our command zone. If you are not able to consistently refill your hand, then just casting a bunch of one-for-ones on people and stopping some of their various threats that you feel you have to stop won't result in you ever winning the game. You'll just stop someone from winning and then someone else will win and you'll lose. But because we have consistent card advantage in the forms of Talion, filtering through Ledger Shredder, Ristic Mystic Wondering, but really the fact that we have this semi-Ristic study in the command zone allows us to continuously refill throughout the game and refill confidently. Because remember, we want our opponents to take game actions. The more game actions they take in our generic based strategy, the more cards we draw and the more interaction we have to use and tempo them out of the game. Yes, yes, agreed. And, and that kind of leads to you know the game pattern uh, that you're going to see when you're playing Talion effectively. And that is you're 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 looking to get draw engines online, whether that be Talion or, or Ristic, Mystic, uh, the One Ring, whatever. You probably want multiple draw engines in play if you can. 
you're drawing lots of cards, your opponents are playing the game, you're not stopping them from playing the game, but you may play a stacks piece that slows them down a little bit, makes them have to get around it. You are looking for them to try to win. You should understand what their path to victory is, and you want to use your interaction to just stop it. They'll try to win, they'll try to do something, they go far, you draw some cards off it, you stop them, next player goes. You know, they progress, they try to go for it, you stop them. That game plan is gonna continue throughout the game. And what you're gonna find is lots of attempts have been made. The game has ground along. Players have lost lots of life. You know, and that, that's kind of how a Italian game plan should go. With that said, so Italian has four major strategies to go from controlling the game to winning the game. And they're all built to some extent around that gameplay pattern where you're going for a long grindy game, you're stopping people from winning, value pieces are still coming down, you're drawing lots of cards, and you get to a, a particular game state where you have a little bit of a setup. And those four major strategies are, first of all, just straight up attrition. When I say attrition, we're gonna bleed our opponents out slowly, put pressure on their life totals, limit their resources, limit their ability to put wins wins into play eventually in the late game. We're gonna do that with cards like Orcish Bowmasters, Italian himself, Shieldred, and the big one being Blood Chief's Ascension. So that attrition plan, the way it's gonna roll is you're gonna get a, a Shieldred in play. So at that point you have Talion, you have, uh, maybe you have Blood Chief's Ascension. So every game action that your opponents make are gonna do things like, oh, okay, Talion trigger, lose two life, draw a card. I gain two life. Oh, you Rhystic Study, you have a Rhystic Study you're drawing. You're gonna be taking damage and your opponents are at first gonna be like, ah, it's fine, no big deal. I'm not losing that much life. And then, you know, all of a sudden they look up and they've lost 20 life and they're they're starting to dwindle and their life totals are getting low. So many of the decks in the format right now really rely on their life totals to do what they need to do to win. Things like Adnas, things like Necropotence, uh, Ancient Tombs, Mana Crypt Flips, all of those things uh, rely on opponents having a little bit of a, a healthy life total. And Talion and the Attrition Plan attacks that extremely effectively over time. And what's, what's also important is this game plan doesn't have to take you all the way by itself in its slow attrition form. It then breaks into multiple other, I guess, rapid attrition forms, really mass life loss, where once you have something like a Shieldred or a Bowmasters or a combination of those cards, we are able to silver bullet tutor out Time Twister. Right. And very often with the way the, naturally, the, the game naturally progresses, we're able to just cast a Time Twister, kill our opponents that way. Very similar idea when we have Blood Chiefs out. Oh, everyone's at about 20 life or midway through the game. You can just cast a Mnemonic Betrayal. And guess what? Mnemonic Betrayal, even if you don't care about the cards in their graveyard, it exiles all those cards away from their graveyard. And then an end step puts them all back. And when it puts all of those cards back, every single one of those cards is its own Blood Chiefs Ascension trigger. So while you can naturally get your opponents relatively low on life with the slower attrition plan, which sometimes can get there completely on its own, you are also able to use this attrition plan as a finisher in combination with one of these other explosive methods. Yeah, and there's there's also some subtle ways to do exactly that. You know, you'll you'll find yourself in games where you have a shieldred on board, your opponent's at a relatively low life total, like eight or, you know, six or eight life or something like that, and you have a Cephalid Coliseum on board, right? And they don't notice it, they don't think about it, but at any point, you can activate that Cephalid Coliseum, target them, they draw three cards, they take six damage, they die, right? You have you have a lot of sneaky things like that that you could do once the attrition plan is really, really cooking. You can do things like, oh, I'll kill one of your creatures that goes to the graveyard, you take two damage that you didn't expect, now you're, you're dead or you can't do anything else, right? I've done that in people's lines when they're getting really low on blood chiefs. I'll just pongify their thing. Guess what? Goes to the graveyard. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that's that's the attrition plan. The other nice thing about the attrition plan is, like like you said, it enables late game wins via our other strategies that we'll get to in a minute. And it does that because with Talion on board, if it's on two, for example, your opponent's life totals are low, that limits the amount of you know interaction that costs two. So what it ends up doing is their life total becomes your Grand Abolisher because they can't interact anymore without dying, which leads to our other win methodologies. In my mind, the greatest one and the most powerful win condition that we really have in our deck is the Holebreaker Horror. Uh, and a lot of people look at Holebreaker Horror in Talion and they get very confused. And I think that's because there's this you know, major misconception about what Holebreaker Horror actually does. I think the big misconception about Holebreaker Horror is that you need to have an infinite mana outlet in the command zone in order for, in order for it to, to work. And the reality is that's just not true because Holebreaker Horror doesn't just create infinite mana, it creates infinite ETBs, it creates infinite casts. So 
any card that that wins the game that way like if i cast orchid spell master infinite number of times infinite etbs it wins if you cast the one ring over and over again you draw your deck um if you uh have a clone effect of a thrasios that someone else has on board it becomes the outlet right so Holbrook Ahar wins in so many different ways in, in our deck in particular, because the way that our game plan works, the way that the games grind out is by the time you're casting a Holbrook Ahar, there's been a lot of development. There's been a lot of things that have happened. You're likely to have a set of piece in play or your opponents are likely to have, you know, the leftover piece that of a attempted win that you could utilize to win. You know, Holbrook Ahar just wins games and you, you, you've known that forever because you run it in Kinnon. Well, I was going to say, like, everything that you just said. <laughs> it's, it's one of those cards that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it should work on paper because everyone imagines when you're when you're building a deck and hypothesizing how it functions, you're way too focused on yourself a lot of the time. And so a lot of people think, oh, I need to have the outlet in my command zone because I need Hullbreaker to work with my deck. And that's just, yeah, like you said, it's not how it works. It's one of those cards that, while it doesn't seem like it should work beautifully on paper, it works incredibly well anecdotally. And the reason it works so well anecdotally, like you said, is because we have reached these games where there is board development there are things on board we have access to other people's things so using our own deck when you get to these late game states you always have the mana rocks to go infinite with mana the mana is almost never the concern the best ways are when you have a clone effect because if i have a clone effect it's very often able to go infinite as a dock side and then it can finish as other things that allow it to be the outlet if there's a cannon on board that gives me access to bowmaster because i can just activate my own my cannon there to get it if they have a thrasios i draw if someone else has an attracts i draw my deck if someone else has a tivit i make infinite clues i draw my deck there's almost always something on board i've even done it where my opponents have a bowmaster and i don't kill it on purpose so that i I can go infinite cloning their bowmaster as my clone comes right. in and out after being a dockside or something like that. It just naturally will always find a way. Um, my most preferred method of doing it when I have access to whatever is I will get the one ring first. I generally say Hallbreaker plus one tutor equals a win because we're able to get the one ring and then draw our deck, and that's normally the safest fashion. I also think that is safer than doing it just tutoring for bowmaster because the one ring is a harder thing to deal with as you are bouncing it back and forth when there are more ways in the format to deal with a bow masters on top of your hallbreaker horror trigger or something like that um so i think that that's really really important yeah uh so yeah i definitely recommend always getting the one ring first and then bow master but again if they've if you've lost your one ring and for some reason there's nothing on the board as an outlet and you know you don't have access to your own bowmaster you can still <laughs> often find a way to draw your deck and just cast a thor a thoracal do it the old-fashioned way it's one of those cards that just always ends up working and what's so nice about hallbreaker horror is it works perfectly with our generic game plan of drago control where it's not this seven drop that we have to tap out for it's this thing that has flash and we can wait until the right opportunity on an end step to cast it and then once hallbreaker horror is on the battlefield which it's uncounterable unless they have a mind break trap it is landing on the battlefield it also protects itself it naturally protects itself because it turns every single one of your instant speed effects whether that's a bowmaster an opposition agent a subtlety a tashana's or one of your actual instants all of those cards now double as an additional counter spell yeah so it naturally protects itself incredibly well and with the amount of cards we have in hand with the way our deck is constructed it's a rare day that someone's able to stop you in my in my tournament run around four when someone had a galadriel's dismissal on my final turn with hallbreaker horror and that was their last mana i even went as far as trick binding my own hallbreaker horror trigger to bounce their galadriel's dismissal back to hand with the new hallbreaker horror trigger that created yeah. like you can always do something yes yeah <laughs> what's what's hallbreakers on board you have mana available you have instance in hand it's very 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 difficult to stop you uh, and and just to sort of catalog it a little bit you know there are uh a plus b with hullbreaker horror in this deck so you know as long as you have the the ability to set up the loop and you have hullbreaker horror we have a ton of outlets that work with it wishclaw talisman is an outlet because you bounce it from your it's opponent's board you put it back in on your yeah. on your board you tutor whatever the hell you want right you tutor your whole deck at that point yeah. if you play the one ring like we've said you draw your entire deck you play orcish bowmasters it's infinite pings uh you can get a, another clone so either a metamorph or sakashima the imposter make a second hullbreaker horror now you can bounce all of your opponent's non-land permanents to their hand before you pass the turn if you have to and that's not including all of the copy effects that we're talked about if your opponent has a wish cloud talisman copy artifact becomes a, a a b uh if they or metamorph is still a b if your opponents have a thrasios and you have a clone guess what that's a you win right so hullbreaker horror is the a to a lot of a plus b combos in the deck i gotta give credit here the reason we really 
finally adopted Holebreaker Horror has to the credit has to go to Ashani because Ashani played it in a tournament, uh, Path to the Peak, and he's like, listen to me, Holebreaker Horror is the best win con for me in Italian. It's the most consistent way to win games, and I didn't believe him, but I'm like, you know what? I'll trust you. And I put it in the deck, brought it to the top deck, and sure enough, that that card has become the single cleanest way to win the game with Italian. It's our way to seize windows. So that's that's the number two strategy. Number three strategy is I, I for sure I for sure never tried to convince you on Hallbreaker before that. Yeah, but you didn't push that hard. You didn't push that hard. Yeah. Oh, I did. I didn't push super. You said what about Hallbreaker? You said what about Hallbreaker? Yeah. You also said what about? You also said what about? You also said what about Thought Vessel? So like. Uh, I stand by the Thought Vessels kind of gas. I will forever stand. Team Thought Vessel, bro. Like, we have so many cards. Yeah, anyway, anyway. So, yeah. So, that's, you know, Holbreaker Horror. That's one strategy. That's strategy number two, if you will. Attrition being number one. Holbreaker Horror being number two. But sometimes maybe Holbreaker is even the head of Attrition. You know, whatever. I think it's number one. Yeah. I, it's, my, it's my preferred. Attrition, like, attrition is kind of the underlying uh, strategy for the whole deck, but not necessarily a win. Yeah. It's sort of the second win. Holbreaker Har is supported by the attrition plan, though. Um, also, so number three, and you'll find that these all layer together very nicely. So Mnemonic Betrayal is kind of our third way to win the game. And it dovetails nicely with the attrition plan with Blood Chief's Ascension. It dovetails nicely with Holbreaker Horror because a lot of times what you're going to do is you're going to play Mnemonic Betrayal. That's going to get you to Holbreaker Horror. That's going to get you to win the game. It's it's very similar to how a lot of decks say Underworld Breach is my win. Underworld Breach gets you the win. Oh, Ad Nauseam is my win con. It gets me the win con. Meme Bet functions the same way in our deck where as the game is naturally developed in our game where we're countering lots of really nice things, we can now take those things and win the game with them. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So, <laughs> so Meme Bet is, is, is a big one. And then our final win con, a lot of people look at the Demir deck. Well, but while we're yeah, go on. while we're on that, I just want to mention. Mm -hmm. I think this is. I, I assume we're going to talk about some notable inclusions later, but I think this is very important right now with mnemonic betrayal. The most common card we see when we look at other people's Italian decks is for some reason they add Dothy. Dothy yep, 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 yep. And, <laughs> and I'm like, why are you playing Dothy? Please don't, because it, it fucks up the attrition plan because it turns off your blood chiefs. And it fucks up your meme bet plan. Like those are two of your most common ways that you're gonna put yourself in a winning position. And this deck is already not the most dense on winning positions. Yeah. So you really don't want to take those away for yourself. Dothy is a powerful card. It is a viable CDH card. But within what we are trying to accomplish, it does not work optimally within our right. Because we're we're looking to play the long game and have the game set up for us to be able to win later. And Dothy interferes with that directly. The other problem is it creates a lot of awkward situations where you know people will argue. And they say, well, you can get rid of Dothy at any time. Well, we also run Curse Totem in our deck. So what happens when, oh, oops, we played a Curse Totem because it was really effective. And then we played a Dothy. And now we can't crack the Dothy. So we've cut ourselves off of a lot of things that we want to do. And we don't have a way to remove it. And it, it really <laughs> it screws us over pretty hard. Uh, there's another card in I've, the deck. I've won a lot of games. Yeah. Yeah, pongifying a dockside and then casting a meme bet, being like, so yeah, there yeah, you go. yeah, That's hell yeah. <laughs> like, it, like, it also cuts off. <laughs> it also cuts off cards like Drown of the Lock. You know, which, you know, if you're playing Dothy, Drown of the Lock is a terrible card to play in your deck. So don't play Dothy. Like I can't emphasize it enough. Like it is a terrible card for Italian. It makes a deck that struggles to win struggle even more to win. Don't play it, please, dear God. <laughs> we could we could do a whole episode on just why we hate Dothy. Oh. <laughs> and, and and just to be clear, you know, I you know my first deck. Everyone knows me for Florian. I fucking love Dothy. Dothy is a critical part of Florian. It, it can't be blocked though. Come it, on, that's perfect it can't be for blocked. You. It turns into counter magic for me <laughs> usually when I try to win. It's so good. It's so good in Florian. It is terrible in Italian. It, I'm not biased against Dothy. I love Dothy. Do not play it in Italian, please. Okay, so that moves us to the last and final strategy in Italian, uh, which is a very delicate one. It is the cleanest win con in Demir. And the worst win con in our the deck. The worst win con in our <laughs> deck. And that is, you know, Thoracle Consult, Thoracle Tainted Pact. Um, and, you know, it should be obvious to most people by now, but the problem with Thassa's Oracle and Demonic Consultation with Italian on board is let's say Italian is on two. You do Thassa's Oracle, you exile your entire deck, and your opponent casts a meaningless two drop. You're now forced to draw and you can lose the game. So you have to be always cognizant of that. And there's a lot of tricks in the deck to get around it, a lot of ways to, you know, to, to play carefully so you can win. Um, one of the coolest ones that, that I've done is you do uh, 
you put Thassa's Oracle on the stack, and then you respond to the ETB trigger by casting with dress, uh, dress down. down. Exactly. I love I love that yeah. line. I love it so yeah. much. I do that shit all the time yeah. because it also turns off endurance, it which is so nice. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic. It's extremely effective. So it turns off your Talion. Your Thassa's Oracle trigger is already on the stack, so you don't care anymore. And now you can demand a consultation to your heart's content and not worry about it. The obvious other ways are just kill your Talion. Or Tainted Pact is fine. You can normally just put like leave two cards in library. Yeah, leave a couple of cards, try to get a good sense for it. Or just frankly, you know, be careful. Make sure you know what your opponents have. Look at their board state. You know, play accordingly. It's not as hard as you think. You can do it. Um, and sometimes you just have to send it anyway. <laughs> yeah, just throw caution to the wind and go for it. You know, it usually works out. Um, I've never... We've been, unfortunately... We, we've been legit rewarded by our fuck it, we ball moments in tournaments. <laughs> we <laughs> we both think, I don't think we've ever been screwed yeah. over. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And then the other thing, you know, with the play pattern is people will eventually go to kill your Talion. And I find that oftentimes it happens at the perfect moment. Right? I've got my Thassa's Oracle. I've got my Demonic Consultation in hand. And they go to kill my Talion. I'm like, oh, gee. <laughs> damn. <laughs> well, I'm not going to fight you on it. That resolves. Yeah, my turn. If, if you ever, if you ever, if you ever target my Italian and I go, oh no, <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> you're absolutely yeah. fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll even try to look upset, like you know, because I don't want to give it away too, obviously. <laughs> but like, yeah, you're like, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Yeah, I was like, oh, but what about the cannon? You should kill the cannon. Okay, fine. Yeah. He dies. <laughs> Uh, Italian dies. Okay, I'm not, uh, is this? Or you sit there, you're like, oh, is this worth fighting over? Yeah, nah, I guess. Sit not. there, like, go. You, you <laughs> pretend to go in the tank for like 30 seconds and think about uh, it, like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, <laughs> yeah. So you know, just things to keep in mind. You know, I generally don't win with Thassa's Oracle that often, but you do, you do at times. Sometimes you get lucky and you have the turn two Thoracle Consult, and you don't even play Italian. And that's a free win. It happens sometimes. I've never done that. I've done it a couple. I've, I've done it. That. I've done it a couple times. <laughs> you've, yeah. you've had turn two. I have. I have. Yeah, I've done it. It's so dumb. Yeah, that's so. You just gotta dumb. get lucky, you know. Uh, uh, you know. But yeah, so th those are the main strategies. A uh, really important part of playing the deck is picking your number. Now, there's been a lot of discourse in CDH about which number is best on Talion since the deck came out. As we are, I'm sure, going to talk about when just generically going over control strategies, you are inherently so rewarded on a control strategy by having a really intricate understanding of your opponent's decks. And that carries over that same knowledge in what number to pick, where it really is overall matchup dependent. There are some matchups where even if I land Italian on turn one, I'm picking one, or if I landed on turn one, I'm picking two. You do have to be able to tell the difference between those two things. They overall are not going to be as different than you think, but generically speaking, if you are learning the deck and you're not sure what number to pick in the matchup yet, we recommend in the early game, starting with the number two. The reason we like the number two is because it tends to be cards that people are naturally going to cast anyway. Your Talismans, your Signets, your Timnas, your Kinnons, your tutors, you know, demonic tutors, etc., all just happen to be two drops. And so two tends to be a really, really good number for early game development and setup. And then as you get towards the later parts of the game, if your Talion dies and you get to recast it, oftentimes at this point, I might choose the number one, because here's where you get to lots of the one mana interaction when those stack battles do occur. Lots of Whirly Tutor and Lightning Tutor, you know, little one drops that come into play. It is still a delicate balance between the two and it is gonna function a lot based on matchup, but overall, early game, I recommend just putting it on two is a little bit safer. Sometimes you'll be punished by this. And then if it dies, if you're in a late game situation where you, it's not going to be a lot of onboard development and much more just people are going to try and win the game now, then I recommend number one. Yeah, because one one becomes better at that point because most of the interaction that people are going to be using are one drops, right? So you're going to have a stack war that develops. And you're going to draw a bunch of cards off of it, and that can make the difference between winning and losing. Um, but you'll you'll yeah. find as you play the deck, it becomes a little bit more obvious. You'll see certain decks across from you. And you'll know that deck at that point. And you're like, oh, you know, I'm playing against Rogsai. One seems pretty good, probably, depending on where you are in the game. Um, you know, those mm -hmm. things those things will work out for you. Rog's got a lot of it twos. does. Rog's so, got a lot of twos and threes. So you know what's interesting <laughs> is when I play against Rog, right? Against Rog, one is better early and two is better late, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird. Yeah. Right. Because when they want to win the game, it's all Breach, Brain Freeze, whatever, yeah. Demonic Tutor, Thassa's Oracle, like they murder themselves. Right. But early game, they're playing lots of one drops. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. All right. So let's <laughs> let's go into the deck now and start looking through, you know, some of the some of the choices that are made and and talk about them a bit. We'll talk about 
um, the creature package, I think, first. And we'll talk about Karn at the same time. I mean, I've been playing Karn for a long time. Obviously, I used to play this in Kinnon. I recently took it out of Kinnon, and the reason for that was lack of accessibility. We are a black deck with unconditional tutors, which means I have access to Karn when Karn is busted, which means if I want a Null Rod effect, I can get a Null Rod effect. And there are a lot of decks that it's awkward to play Karn because they can't protect him well. We have a 3-4 flyer in the command zone, which generically blocks most of the things in the format. And then same thing, if you look at our creature base, we have stuff like Shieldred and Spellskite and Ledger Shredder. All of these functions, those really, really good blockers as well. Um, so the card is normally able to survive, and there are very few decks in the format that are able to present a consistent win attempt while a Karn is on the table. Yeah, I've, I've found typically if I land a turn one or turn two Karn, I win those games most of the time. Like they're just extremely backbreaking to almost every deck in the format at this point. Going from there into our, our creatures. So, uh, you know, I'm not gonna talk about every single card choice, but I will highlight sort of a theme here. And that is you'll see cards like Subtlety and Tishana's Tidebinder and uh, Orcish Bowmaster and Guild the Drake. And these are all cards that serve as both creatures and as interaction, an extremely powerful interaction coming from angles that your your opponent is not expecting number one and number two gets around a lot of the things that would normally stop pieces of interaction for example your opponent cracked a ranger captain well tashana's tide binder and subtlety are still online and still functional you could still drop an orcish bowmaster you could still stop an opposition agent those are all things that you could still do around a ranger captain that will often stop your opponent from winning and and frankly he presents a, a gotcha moment in a lot of cases. You know, your opponent cracks a ranger captain, thinks it's safe to go for it, and they go and drop their Thassa's Oracle on the battlefield while you're holding up Tishana's Tidebinder and laughing, right? That does happen. Uh, other cards that are in the creature set, we have our clones. These are extremely important to the deck. We've got Metamorph. We've got Sakashima the Imposter. Sakashima is all star in this deck. And right from the beginning, you know, Max, you know, made the argument that, you know, we really want to be able to have a second Talion or a second Shieldred. So we were looking for, you know, what's the best way to do that? And there's a number of options available, right? You could do Sakashima of a thousand faces. You could do Spark Double. You could do this Sakashima the Imposter. And really what we settled on is that Sakashima the Imposter offers the most flexibility because it can get around the legendary rule, which is great but it can also copy our opponent's things. And that's really what we need, right? Whereas uh, Spark Double only lets you copy your own thing. Sakashima of a Thousand Faces only lets you copy your own thing. So Imposter really offers you the best of both worlds. It is a little bit high costed and sometimes that's an issue, you know, because it's got the double blue pip, but it's, it's, just, it's just so good, so good. We've already talked. The fact that it can bounce back is also super relevant. Yes, yes. The other reason, you know, clones and Gilded Drake are important. You know, people will attempt to steal your Italian. And your clones and your Gilded Drake are oftentimes the easiest defense against that that also moves you ahead. So, um, you know, that's important. Obviously, we've talked about Shieldred and Bowmaster as part of the attrition plan. We know about Hallbreaker Horror. Spellskite is so good. So good. Ooh. So I don't think people understand how good Spellskite is. So, yes, it protects our things, and that's fantastic. It's a good blocker. That's great. But it also disrupts our opponent's attempts to win games as well. You know, if you're... So, well. so you're, let's say you're playing against an Obnixilus deck and they have a, a Dockside on board and they would like to uh, saw in half their Dockside. Well, they're not going to do it with your Spell Skite on board. It's not just specific targeted removal, though. It's so many win lines in the format. It, you want a Magda to go for a Clock Combo? Hilarious. You want an Ajila to try and unstap with their dele with their Derevi? Get fucked. You want a Polymorph deck to try and Polymorph? Not going to work, my guy. You want Sisse to go through some of their Tutor Chains? Not always going to work. If they're using Tyvar Derevi, that can't work. Anything that can target any permanent, it doesn't work through a Spell Skite. We have the stop on you. You will not be able to complete your win line and i love it and so many people forget about spell sky and they will get through this position where they're like getting ready to cast a mnemonic betrayal and then the last thing they'll do is they'll try and get rid of an opponent's Duraneth, and you're like lol and no yep, yep. <laughs> you know and it, it also it protects artifacts and creatures from types of removal which is super super important it also is very good at protecting karn because karn is generally only stopped by things that are like chain of vapor and psych rift which can target anything spell Skite is an incredible protective piece an incredible blocker an incredible stacks piece it always has overperformed for me in every single deck i've ever played it in i absolutely love the yeah card. agreed agreed all right moving on to sorceries so uh, the first one up there is, is one I love to talk about, and and this like this you, I got to give you credit for Seagate Restoration because you you sang its praises 
in the beginning and you know i've learned to absolutely love this card so first of all it's a land drop cool great number two it untapped untapped yeah Easy. untapped all right number two it pitches to force of will it pitches to all of our our pitch a blue card you know counter magic or interaction all right does all of that Which a lot of a lot of decks a lot of decks are just chrome mox force force we're a deck that is Chrome Mox, Force, Force, Misdirection, Subtlety. Like, we have a lot of things to pitch blue cards yeah. to. Yeah, you can also Mystical Tutor for a land drop by getting your Seagate Restoration, mm -hmm. right? There's, it's just a extremely flexible card, and I have cast it. I have cast it in games, in late game, where I go and draw 12 cards, and I end up with 25 cards in hand, or whatever the number is in my hand, no maximum hand size, and pass the turn, and just 1v3 the table without you know breaking a sweat. Right. It's just it's just fantastic. Imperial Seal, obvious. You know, Demonic Tutor, obvious. Mnemonic Betrayal, Tutors. we've already talked about enough at this point. Time Twister is a dual purpose card. And you'll find that almost all the cards in this deck are dual purpose, right? Or even triple purpose in this case. So Time Twister, number one, yes, it's a wheel. So it can refill our hands if we you know, have a low mull or something like that. And we need to just generically Time Twister. But it also is a silver bullet with Shieldred or Bowmaster in a lot of cases. You know, I have games where I'm just quietly like, oh, I have a Shieldred. What else do I need? How many? How much life do you have? And I'm just sitting there counting life totals with the Time Twister in my hand, right? So there's that. There's also... Uh, ta it's also yeah. it's also our only way to recur Yes, things. exactly. Yeah. So if you, you end up in a game where, okay, my Blood Chiefs got countered, my Shieldred got countered, Thassa's Oracle's in the graveyard, everything's in the graveyard, Time Twister, let's reset, let's get back into this game, right? It does that for us. Uh, Toxic Deluge, We this is our only... You know, real board wipe other than Cyclonic Rift and, you know, meta dependent. Like I could see an argument to bring in an additional t board wipe depending on what you're running into. But Toxic Deluge generally does the job because so much of our, our, our creatures in this deck are four toughness or better. We can generically do three and destroy everything and have no damage done to us. Like our board state remains intact. Our advantages remain intact. And if we have to, we can do more. And that's why if you do want to add an additional board wipe, my board wipe of preference that comes up next for us is Agreed. Yeheni's Expertise, yep. which is a four drop board wipe that all creatures get minus three, minus three, conveniently leaving our Italian. And then also lets you cast a two drop for free. So I've often had a play pattern back when we were playing the card of cast Yeheni's and then just like finish with a demonic yes. tutor or finish with a cursed totem on the board because it just lets you be a little bit more mana efficient. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. And then the last last of the sorceries, we have Beseech the Mirror. You know, this is a card where I've looked at, like, oh, do I love this card? Do I, do I hate this card? I'm like, maybe I should cut it. And then inevitably, every time I say that, I play a game, like, get Beseech the Mirror. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, this just wins me the game. <laughs> or this just lets me run away with the game. Because it gets so much of our, our value pieces in this deck, our four drops or better. So we can get that one ring. We can get a Shieldred. We can get a uh, Thoracle or Consult or whatever we need to, to win the game. I get Karn a lot. Yeah, I, Karn's fantastic. You know, there's just so many options. Sometimes I use it to get a Toxic Deluge and, you know, and that's what I really need or get a Mnemonic Betrayal. You know, the only thing it really doesn't get is Hullbreaker Horror. I think everything else in the deck you can yeah. get. No, it literally casts every single other card in the deck. The only one it doesn't cast is and, 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 you know, one thing people forget about when it comes to Beseech the Mirror is you can get a Hullbreaker Horror. You just can't cast it for free, right? So it, it literally gets everything, casts almost everything in the deck for free off of a, uh, a bargain. And there's almost always something to bargain because, like I said, you know, these games go long. There's, you know, junk laying on the battlefield. You got a tapped uh, mana vault sitting there. Get rid of it. Going into going into instance, obviously, we have a very deep package of interaction. We're going to go through things by number here. It doesn't make a ton of sense to talk about too many of the counter spells individually. So generically speaking, let's start with numbers. When you're looking at our counter spell package, we have one, two, three, four. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen pieces of stack based counter magic in our instance. We then, for removal, have one, two, three, four, five, six pieces of onboard removal, and then it's filled out the rest with tutors such as Vampiric Tutor and Limb Duel's Fault and Tainted Pact and Demonic Consultation, which I would rather not count as a tutor. When you're looking at our instance, you're going to see a lot of just CDH staples here. Obviously, your forces, your like first nine to ten counter magic pieces are all very, very you know, you are those are already determined for you what you're going to be doing. Where it gets really interesting for this deck is in some of our more niche ones that we've already started to talk about. When you go as deep as running stuff like Spell Pierce, which is really good in the early 
early game against Rhystic Study and Value Engines, when you have your Spell Snare to hit lots of specific win pieces, when you have your Stern Scolding to stop a ton of really important creatures in the format. Again, not a card I want to run in a generic commander deck, but in one that is trying to tempo your opponents and make the game go longer, this is really good at just setting them back a turn, giving you more talent triggers, gaining you more value. Mana Drain is a recent re-inclusion to the deck. It was one that we started playing at first, and we ended up cutting because the two blue was a harder mana cost to hold up. You are often very much bottlenecked on your number of interactive pieces by how much blue you're able to hold up, but since the inclusion of Hallbreaker Horror and having some of these larger CMC pieces that we really want to get down, Mana Drain has often had the play pattern of giving us that little bit of mana boost to get that one turn of setup that gives us our lock on the game really, really, really well. Um, so I've been a huge fan of Mana Drain since re-adding it. Trickbind is obviously one that Max pushed for a ton. This was a card I was not high on when we started talking about the deck. I was never high on Trickbind. I'd never cast the card, though, and this man has convinced me in full. This, this card is absolutely incredible. I kind of want to play it in more decks. It hits so much shit, and it has split second. There's nothing you could do about it. So thank you, Daddy Max, for <laughs> showing me the ways of the trick bind now uh, one piece that that we talked about and we've really learned to love is winds rebuke uh this was previously chain of vapor and we are a deck that is running a ton of things on board that our opponents want to get rid of between Bowmasters and Shieldred and Cursed Totems and Graft Diggers Cages and Weathered Rootstones, etc. There's so many things that our opponents would just happily sack a land to get rid of. So Chain of Vapor was a little bit of an issue for us, even though it is more mana efficient, and I am very big on mana efficiency. But Winds of Rebuke similar to a lot of other cards in the deck it just fills multiple roles it's one more mana for it can bounce anything including your own stuff which is super important but it also has the advantage of messing up top deck tutors because each opponent each player has to put the top two cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard when it resolves and then you can also use it to feed your blood chief's ascension or mnemonic betrayal because you are putting those cards in the graveyard so while it doesn't look like the most efficient thing in the world it does enough in a various range of categories that we've really really enjoyed the card in recent memory yep. shielders edict is an interesting one was real high on it initially but it turns out it's extremely powerful it's a tempo card you, know, you get these games where you your, your opponent goes you know dork pass dork pass commander pass and then you go shoulders edict and set them back to the stone age it's just a beautiful thing yeah. uh, it doesn't always happen but it's really good also really good against things like tivet so shoulders edict is, is a very powerful card limdol's vault a lot of people look at it and question that card is uh, fucking amazing in this deck because you get to know your next five cards um, and you're going to draw them with Talion. So you get to set things up and kind of think ahead and know what's coming. It's really, really powerful. Uh, it gets around Opposition Agent. It gets around Aven Mind Center. Really, really good card. Uh, Drown on the Lock is also a spectacular card because, you know, again, we're not playing Dothy. We want our opponents to have graveyards. We just don't want them to use them. So having, you know, this flexible card that can both kill a creature and counter a spell very very good move it on move it on to artifacts most of these are just pretty mostly you know, mostly staples but you know, i will call out you know our stacks package which is extremely effective graph Digger's cage weathered runestone cursed totem and a lot of people you know will look at that and be like hey you know you should run uh, urza saga because it can go get you graph Digger's cage no because if you have weathered runestone it does no. nothing right <laughs> we don't want that <laughs> so <laughs> you know, Curse Totem, Graft Digger's Cage, Weathered Runestone, those guys are extremely powerful in the meta right now. Shuts down you know, so many things that our opponents are trying to do. And they're static pieces, so they answer multiple things at the same time. So much more effective than a counter spell most of the time. The one artifact that's really interesting here is the Imposter Mech. I, I very often, when talking to people about this card in a generic sense, say, oh, there's no world I run Imposter Mech before I run both Phantasmal Image, Flesh Duplicate, and Phyrexian Metamorph, until I have all of those three Imposter Mechs, like the next one down. But when you look at our specific deck, we're on Sakashima because it can clone our legends. We're on Phyrexian Metamorph because it hits everything and it hits artifacts. So we're able to steal one ring and Witch Claws and stuff like that. When you look at Imposter Mech we, versus something like Flesh Duplicate or Metamorph, we actually don't really care about cloning our own things that are not legendary very much at all. They're kind of irrelevant. So we are far more interested in our opponent's creatures for the things we're cloning with something like Imposter Mech. So the fact that it is something that only clones our opponent's stuff as a regular clone is not a big issue. And the fact that it is an artifact and not a creature tends 
tends to be an enormous upside where we're able to make bowmasters that are essentially permanent. We're able to, you know, get around stuff like dress down and other messes with creature effects. And, and just, it also works just to be a dock side. It works, you know, it goes infinite if they have a devoted druid. It ends up just doing a lot of things incredibly, incredibly well. Yes. Um, I mean, if you saw my finals game, I used it multiple times. I used it in my top 16 and finals to be a Lawan Cephalid Empress, which was a non creature thing I was able to play as a blue creature clone. Um, then it was a shield or then it was a bowmasters the card tends to be very flexible and very effective and very hard for your opponents to deal yep. with yeah great card all star the deck you're never getting it so really good and then obviously we got the one ring and we got witch claw talisman which you know both of those cards yep. you know, win games with hullbreaker horror so just really really good which clause just it's a one card win con with Hellbreaker. Yeah. It gets you Hellbreaker and then it gets you your outlet. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'll, a typical pattern I'll play Wish Claw Talisman, pass, get to my next turn. Hey, one mana, get Hellbreaker Horror, start the loop, win game. Like it's fantastic. Yeah. Um works great. Yeah. Enchantments, these are pretty standard. You know, obviously we've talked about Blood Chiefs Ascension enough. Counterbalance, we've talked about dress down, Ristic Study, Mystic Remora. Copy artifact is actually fantastic. You know, we we had a back and forth argument in the very beginning about whether to run uh, Thought Vessel or whether to run you know, Demir Signet or, you know, trying to figure out what to put in, in that two mana rock spot, you know, that didn't, none of them felt real good. And copy artifact basically fills that niche extremely well, because most of the time your opponents have a rock that you can copy with it. So it function as that, but it also can copy the one ring. It can copy a wish claw talisman. It can copy, you know, maybe you need to, you want to double down and have two cursed totems because you're afraid one will get removed. It's super flexible in this deck. And it typically wins the game with Holberger Har. So really, really good card. I mean, I don't think we have to spend too much time on lands here. The additional value that our lands provide outside of colors. Uh, Cabal Pit can be removal. Cephaly Coliseum can mess up your opponent's Thoracle wins, as well as just be a way to dig yourself a little bit deeper on cards. Forbidden Orchard has kind of been an all-star for me in the current meta, just giving your opponents things to block and kill Timnas, uh, block and kill Ragavans. You know, we don't really care that much about giving our opponents little one-ones. We're more than happy if they swing them at each other. Uh, the annoying thing can be when they are blocking when we want stuff to do damage but if you're in that position in the game you're late enough that you normally have enough mana it's not an issue and you don't have to tap the land Manamo is absolutely fantastic with the one ring it's a completely broken interaction that allows you to draw pretty much more than twice as many cards and also gives you the capability to hold up shieldred and talion and such as blockers if necessary we have Ottawara as interaction obviously being able to bounce pretty much anything in the format works through a grand abolisher absolutely fantastic which is also what's really important about cabal pit cabal pit is able to hit a grand abolisher Plaza of Heroes is a recent addition that Max convinced me on, primarily with the purpose of protecting your Shieldred. Talion dying isn't the end of the world. You can always recast her, or sometimes you don't even bother. But Shieldred is a piece you prefer to not lose when you have it already. So Plaza of Heroes has functioned as a great way to just make sure he sticks around. You'll notice that we're running a little bit less fetch lands than we absolutely can. Um, and that's because we have limited fetch targets and we don't want to be in a position where we have a fetch land sitting there that we can't turn into usable mana because making our land drops in this deck is extremely important. Fortunately, we draw lots of cards, so that's not too hard to do. I don't know how you feel about Odawara, but I will try to keep that in my hand as long as I can. If it's the only land and I need to make my land drops, I'll play it. But... Yeah, otherwise I try to I try to hold it. Notable exclusions. You notice we're not running City of Traders again because we value sustainability over speed in this deck. Final word, Phantom is a card that a lot of people talked about alongside Born Upon a Wind. The fact of the matter is this deck is mostly instant speed already. And Final Word Phantom doesn't offer that sort of multi-purpose role that we really uh, crave in this deck. So sure, you can play it. It gives you some value, but that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for cards that do it all. Um, and, and Phantom does not do that. Born Upon the Wind, it also, you know, it it provides instant speed potential win lines, but, you know, the... F cool. <laughs> yeah, but the rest of the time, it does literally nothing. Guess what? I can cast my counter spells at instant speed now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> is that sick, dude? Yeah, it's just not good. Uh, flush Duplicate's an interesting exclusion. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, while it's a great clone, you know, our, we're in a long game. So Flush Duplicate, you know, most decks, hey, three fade counters, that's forever. For us, that's like no time at all, and we will lose that flesh duplicate in most games where we play it. So that's why it's not in there. You know, we looked at things like Narset or Notion Thief, you know, those kind of things. The, the problem with those is they die too easily and they don't provide the impact we're looking for. They stop our opponents from playing the game until they're removed. And we do not, again, we are not a stacks deck. We do not want to stop our opponents from playing. We want them to play. 
right? And those because genuinely, like our our clock is slow. We are not good at winning the game. We need to grind and find the win. So if your opponents stop playing, you're not going to be able to play either. Yeah, exactly. The last thing you want is a game state where like you've locked the entire board down to the point where players just draw a card and pass. Because guess what? You're stuck. You're not going to win that game. They're not going to win either, but you're getting the draw, and you don't really want that. You want to win games. So you don't want those board states. You want them to be in a place where they can play, they just can't win. One other thing that's really important with this deck is there are some decks in the format, if I'm playing a proactive shell and I'm never worried about time, I do not have to change my play patterns too much between Swiss round and untimed top rounds. Talion is a deck that is not afforded that luxury. <laughs> we we tend to be a very slow deck. So, I mean, you can, if, you, if you're able to go back and see any of my games or, or hear about them, I was pushing game actions in every Swiss round. You have to be on your opponents to be making decisions. You have to be telling people to keep keep things moving along. You can't be sitting there, sitting in the tank for too long. You have to be efficient. It also really changes the things you tutor for, I noticed, where when you are in a timed round, you are much more likely to use a tutor on some type of game-winning lines proactive piece, whether that be a meme bet, a hallbreak, or Horror, Thassa's Oracle, whatever. When I'm in an untimed round, I am able to trust in my ability to control a lot better and not worry about the clock, and I'm more likely to utilize that tutor on something like a shield or a Karn to really lock the game down and make sure that I have it under my control. Because if you're untimed, you don't care how slow this game goes Drago Pass, you will eventually just bleed them out and win that game. Yes, and this deck is extremely hard to stop in untimed rounds. Extremely, extremely powerful deck in untimed rounds. In timed rounds, that's where you really have to do things like it gets to your turn, recognize that you're not really going to do anything very impactful, draw your card, take whatever minuscule game actions you're going to take and quickly pass. Do not wait long. Do not use time on your turn unnecessarily. Be efficient with your time because that will make a huge difference. But don't difference. forget to go to combat. Yes, yes. Don't forget to go ooh, to combat. Ooh, My God. Ooh, ooh. Tell, so him, tell him, tell him, do you tell him, tell him, tell him, Max. Yeah, yeah. So, so. Uh, yeah, doing doing points of damage everywhere is so important in this deck. So important. So you do not want to do things like take a turn, you have an open attack, and you're just like, ah, eh, whatever, I'm not going to take it. Do your three points of damage. And not only that, but on your opponent's turn, remind them to do their points of damage as well. Because that stuff adds up. So you really have to be efficient about taking those windows and doing whatever little damage you can. Um, and, and and not only that, but like when someone is starting to, you know, move ahead, you see someone has a Ristic study and you know open ring, and they're starting to draw lots of cards and move ahead in the game. Talk to the whole table, convince them, put pressure on them, put pressure on their life total aggressively. Don't miss those opportunities because if you don't, you're gonna find lots of games. You're like, damn, if only I had swung one more time, right? You're gonna get a lot of games like that until you learn. To take those opportunities and swing. Funny enough, you know what? You know, right before you started the tournament in chaos, you, you asked me any last minute advice, and I was like, "Tell your opponents to attack." <laughs> yeah, I definitely, I definitely did my best there. I, I definitely tried to remind them. There's, there's a couple that even I missed. I definitely wasn't, wasn't perfect, but those little percentage points they add up. And when you are playing a deck that is as unforgiving as Talion is, you really need to be tight on those percentage points. Yeah, and then once you're in untimed rounds, uh, your life is gravy. You can just chill. You sit back. Chill. You don't have to push for. Chill. You don't have to push for fast wins. Thassa's Oracle is a card you really don't even want to see, frankly. Right? You want to. You want to get that Blood Chief's Ascension out and just ride it all the way. I'm telling you, it's so mm -hmm. nice. It's so nice. Mm hmm. Which yeah, I mean, if you look at my top 16 and finals game, they both would have gone to draws with the time. Yep. <laughs> I didn't care. <laughs> nope, and it's a whole it is a whole mindset shift you have to be able to make between top between yeah. the Swiss and going into into top round. But yeah, this deck is is fucking amazing. I love it. I love this deck. It's you know, it's our it's my baby, it's our baby. Obviously it's done really well. You know, a lot of people shit talk it still. I enjoy that. Please, please continue shit talking. And you're gonna see a lot more of it. You see a lot of people picking it up right now. Um, I'm going to keep playing it. You're going to see me in tournaments with it. Get ready. Okay, let's go over some mulligans. Uh, let's start generically. No matchup, just to get a feel of hands first. So I'm going to hit restart here, and this is going to be our first seven in a matchup. What do you think? Uh, I think this is a solid hand. I would keep this. 
Yeah, snap keep for me. I mean, you have a turn one fish with additional mana production with the Lotus Petal. Um, you have another stacks piece to keep the game going later. You have a piece of counter magic you're able to hold up the whole time with Spell Pierce. And you have a later piece in Karn. Like, this is a really good hand for just gaining some initial card advantage and then landing down some pieces that are going to make the game go long. So you can utilize that card advantage incredibly well. Yeah, I love having a Spell Pierce open on turn one. You, know, you try to cast your own fish, try to cast your own Ristic Study, get fucked. Not doing it. Yeah, not happening. Not happening. Yep. All right, let's do another one. All right, well... Fish hands are a little easy. Let's go to a next first seven here. <laughs> well, I mean, it has the fish, but we don't have the mana for this one. That's I think we can. I think we can both agree we're <laughs> we're going to second seven here. Uh, here's our second seven. Hey, where's our land in this? What's going on with the shuffler? We we got we got one. We got one. You know. <laughs> hey, we could play that and I then demand a consultation for a mana crypt. No, 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 no. We're not keeping this. That's show. exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go to we'll go to six on this one. Uh, how do you feel about the six? Uh, this is also okay. So this is solid, actually. Okay, because it's great. Yeah, this is a keeper, and and the reason I would keep this is we've got that vamp tutor, we got a mox amber, we got that rhystic study, so we can, you know, play that watery grave, uh, pass the turn, and then on, we can vamp tutor. Gives oh, 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 oh. I mean, while you're while you're looking at the hand though, you don't know that it, that God draws on top. Yeah, we don't but... know that. We don't know that. But yeah, we play the vamp. We, we yeah, play yeah. The, the watery grave. We get to the end step before a turn. We cast a vamp tutor. At that point, we can decide what we're gonna do. Uh, we could either get, you get a mana crypt, right? Well, you could get mana crypt, play uh, Ristic study. You can get a jeweled lotus yeah. and play Talion. You, you can, there's a lot of choices. There's a lot of choices. You know, also, you know, the fact that we drew the soul ring makes the choice really easy because we can, uh, we should be able to get both Ristic study and Talion on port. I think, right? Because we can go. Yes. So yeah. drawing drawing the soul ring changes this entirely. But I think for the purpose of mulligans, it's not really relevant. But yes, getting the soul ring lets you do this on turn one while then holding up Empiric tutor. Yeah. But imagining that you don't have a soul ring, the reason that I would be Vampiric Tutoring for a Mana Crypt here. If you do not draw a land in your first turn, it just gives you turn two Rhystic, and then after turn two Rhystic, you still have Felwar Stone and additional mana development to get out of your Mana Crypt afterwards, and Rhystic is not fish. You do not have to put additional resource into it. That's part of why it's so broken. But if you do draw a land on turn one, and you Vampiric Tutor for Mana Crypt after that, yeah. then that gives you the ability to play the land, play Felwar Stone, and play Ristic Study to get even further mana development. I think either way, I'm going with the turn two Ristic here personally. Ristic just tends to draw more overall cards than Talion, and so I'm, I'm more interested in the card draw than the attrition and life loss in the early game. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I fair. I, you know, it's going to depend to me on what I'm playing against, but you, know, you have the option of going Def either way. Yeah, it's a good one. Mm -hmm. And then on the following turn, when you play Talion, boom. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the other reason uh, I was thinking about it. A... The, the, the Mox Amber makes me want to go for Talion, but yeah. It depends yeah. on depends on the situation. Uh, ooh, this one is interesting. Okay, so I don't think I keep it, but it's close. Uh, it depends what we're playing against. If I'm if I'm looking at a stack strategy with you know uh, my opponents have stacks and they're looking to do activated abilities of creatures, I might be willing to keep this because I could do turn one curse totem, and mm -hmm. sometimes that can be enough to get the game stretched out, and you just need to find one black source and you're off to the races. Um, so I would consider keeping this in certain matchups. Um, yeah, definitely has to be this. This card has to be insane in the matchup. But if it's insane in the matchup, then the play pattern of just like turn one, oh, that makes it a little easier. But yeah, Ancient Tomb, Curse Totem. Honestly, though, would you even do it on turn one? Like in the matchups, this good. And if you're against Kennen or Cissa or something, I think at this point I would just turn one the the this. No, no, I'm turn two. I'm I'm playing it on turn one because if they're gonna play out. dorks, I'm gonna shut their dorks off. It's gonna set them back. Right. Sure, but so if you play this on turn one, though, imagine that you're before... So I guess it depends on, on turn order, because imagining that they have dorks and such. On turn one, I'm playing this either way, because the dorks are not going to be online turn one, so I'm able to see if they play dorks to see if there's a necessity to do this before they can utilize them. And then they've also wasted resource playing their dorks, which feels great that they might have not even bothered doing anyway. But if they don't play dorks on their turn one cycle, and I don't feel the need to shut down activated abilities immediately, then I can just slam a turn to Italian. Yeah, so, so you're talking about after you're talking about sea. you're talking about after drawing the underground sea. Yeah, I agree with you. I would play. Yeah, once you draw the underground sea, my yeah, play pattern changes, changes to yeah. underground sea first. Agreed, agreed. Um, but it, it 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 depends overall. If they already have dorks on board, then of course I'm just doing this and saying LOL. Yeah. But again, that is a very matchup dependent hand for me to consider. It's, a, Let's look it's, at a, another it's first definitely seven. a keeper though. There's no way I'm throwing that back. I think. Well, no, before the underground sea. I, uh, before the underground sea, I could. Yeah, before the underground. After you draw the underground sea, it's a great hand. Yeah. Yeah, then, then it works a, a lot better. It's a lot, lot better. This no. one, just missing the mana. You really need to have foundational resource to get started. 
Uh, this hand's great. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, turn one soul ring into Graph Digger's cage. Uh, yeah, I'll take that. Thank you. And hold up turn, a force of will. Turn to Italian. Hold up a force of will. I have a limb duels to go get something else I want. This is absolutely fantastic. A really common way to think about uh, your Talion. I do not like to keep a turn two Talion that has no further interaction that's immediately relevant or held up for the matchup. Agreed. I will keep a turn one Talion that has no other relevant cards because turn one Talion is just good enough um, because you can kind of trust drawing into some things. But turn two Talion, I want to have something else that I'm immediately holding up or will stop my opponent. So my, my philosophy is once I get down to a mole of five or lower, at that point, I will keep a turn oh, two Talion. Yeah, yeah. But above that, I'm, yes. not, I'm not looking for turn two Talion. Yeah. Yeah, when the when the card choices in hand get slimmer, you uh, you get a little more desperate. But again, if you Looking have at, if you have a hand that's stacked full of interaction and a turn two Italian or even a turn three Italian, that's great. I'm down with that. It's just it's mm -hmm. only when it's yeah. turn two Italian plus nothing that you that I would mull it away every time. You know, until I get to five. What are your thoughts here? Uh, let's see. This one's interesting. Uh, I would throw this back. It's too slow. I mean, Graph Digger's Cage is I good, agree. but it's not enough. Um, and I'm looking at like praying for a land or a rock to get to Italian on turn, you know, three or later even. No, nah, this is a definite throwback for me. Yeah, a little bit too slow. So this is an interesting one. I would probably consider keeping this depending on what I'm running up against because that copy artifact is a mana rock. Right. If I'm against proactive decks, I keep this. Yeah. This is one that I'm not interested in in the like slower activated ability. Like I'm not keeping this against Kinnon per se. But if I'm against like Rogside and Dihada, I think I snap keep yeah, this. Yeah, agreed. Because we have the ability to stop them early and then quickly utilize their graveyard for advantage. And also, like I don't know about you, but I cast Meme Bat all the time when it doesn't win the game. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like I will just I will just assemble an unstoppable board state from the mnemonic betrayal and then pass. Yeah, because it pushes um, so you so far ahead. Shell, it pushes, is yeah, it'll push you so far ahead. It's worth doing most of the time. Dude, I I I'm mnemonic betrayal not too long ago and just stole two Mystic Remoras out of the yard that I've encountered <laughs> and then, <laughs> then passed. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, but yeah, in the in the right matchup, this is definitely one I would consider. Let's let's look at a couple for specific matchups so they can get it to the mindset here. Let's say that you are going second. Uh, on the play is Blue Farm generically. Going third is Kinnon, and going fourth is Rocco. Okay. So you have a, you know, Grixis X deck in first seat that is also predicated on card advantage and willing to take it slow, but has the proactive win cons and one card win cons to go fast if needed. You have Kinnon, which can obviously be very, very explosive, predicated on activated abilities based on a ton of mana, very on board type of deck. And then you have Rocco, which is also a very on board type of deck, but does gain the explosive explosivity of Dockside and Food Chain to win out of nowhere sometimes. And my, my philosophy and side. my philosophy going into that game is I'm looking at blue farm and i want them to play police i want them to get in that police role mm -hmm. I, I want them to take some responsibility and deal with the other players not just me uh, i'm looking at kinnon and i'm trying to point the table at kinnon um, make them you know react to kinnon a little bit stronger than they probably need to if i can uh rocco i've got an eye on rocco and i'm looking for things like cursed totem i'm looking for things you know that can you know an opposition agent for example i'm looking for ways to to, to shut them down. Give me a Graft Digger's Cage. Yeah, yeah. yeah, give me a Graft Digger's Cage and they're done. Give me an Oppo and they're done. Yeah. All right, so our first seven in that matchup. How do you feel about this? Got... Uh, so this is one of those hands where I look at and I almost like it, but I'm probably going to throw it back. It's just a little too slow for me. Yeah. I agree. It's close, though. Looking at a second seven. How do you feel here? Snap keep, baby. That's a good hand. Snap, snap, keep. I love this. Yeah. I am a huge fan of this. I, I'm vamping for a mana crypt here 100%. Are you? Um, uh, yes. Because yes. so here's the 100%, play pattern if you 100%. vamp for mana crypt. Yes, because we yeah, have the second land. Mana crypt. Yeah, we go right into And then you have this. I go right to Italian. Yeah. So then you're holding up mana drain. I go right for Italian. Uh, what is this? You go right for Italian here? Yeah, it turns to Italian. You go, you go for Italian, hold up no interaction. What is this guy? Why is Versus. Stop it, Sammy. So if you turn three Italian here. Mm -hmm. If you turn three Italian, no, then turn you're two holding Italian. up interaction the whole way. No, I get to turn Italian and, and just, here most of the time. It, and just accept that if you lose the game, you lose the game. Yep, most of the time. It depends what the matchup is. I mean, if I'm looking at, like, insane turbo matchup, like if I'm looking at, uh, you know, two rock size or something like that, then, okay, you know, I'm not not going turn two Italian. But most of the time, I'm going turn two Italian here. 
Interesting. Okay, that's fair. I mean, yeah, I guess it depends on on the context of where they're at in their board state at that time. If if I what's don't the see draw? Them being close to presenting anything. What's the draw here? Uh, so your draw in turn one is <laughs> yeah, it's... make it even better, baby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, talisman of dominance, and then yeah, I mean you. Morphic Pool, Vampiric Tutor, honestly, I guess Underground Sea, just because yeah, you yeah. don't need to draw more lands here, really. Yeah, you want to thin out if you can. Underground Sea, Vampiric Tutor, and End Step. Definitely yeah, Crypt. Crypt on top. Yeah. Definitely Crypt here. And now you draw for turn two, and now I just go Command Tower, Mana Crypt. And I mean, yeah, so I guess it depends on what's presented. If I have no concern about losing the game in this turn cycle at all, then it's fine to just play Italian and sacrifice this one turn of development, because then afterwards you're so set up. Or I mean, now you just go double Mana Rock, hold up. Yeah, well, at this point, yeah, now, you're, now, I, you're I, I the, now you're now you're off to the... I, oh, I definitely put the Ledger Shredder there while it's cheap. I would play it. Why? No, 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 no. Because right now you're holding up Mana Drain and Fluster. Yeah. And? Why would you? Why would you only hold up one piece? Yeah, I wouldn't cast a second Felwar. I would have cast. You would just do Ledger, Ledger Shredder. Shredder. Yeah. Sure, that's fine. I mean, the problem though is you, then you're still only holding up one piece of interaction. Well, you're holding one piece of interaction, but you're also going to draw cards. And the Felwar Stone, I kind of want to throw it away. Yes. I kind of want to get rid of that Felwar Stone. I want something better. Interesting. We have a we have a slight difference in opinion here. I I would want to hold up both pieces of Counter Magic. Mm hmm. Because we're on we're on turn three in this cycle, and I mean blue farm obviously fluster is great against blue farm, but all three of these decks are decks I might have to use mana drain on. They're all decks that can play very important creatures. If they throw down a ranger captain or a granite ball straight out of blue farm, obviously lots of things out of Kinnon, obviously lots of things out of Rocco. I don't want to sacrifice my ability to fluster storm blue farm just because I had to use mana drain on Kinnon or Rocco. Yeah, see, I want I want that ledger shredder on board now because I want to start filtering and I want to start growing that ledger shredder and start swinging it. Interesting. Well, slight difference of opinion here. Make your own choice. Do what you think is best. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty close. Give us our, our final pod for Mulligans. Uh, okay, so uh, let's say we're in first seat. I mean, we're in fourth seat. We're in last position. Uh, we've got Rogsai in first. We've got, mm -hmm. let's do a wild card, something off the, off, the, off the beaten track. Let's do, let me think. Um, Sisse. It's not off the beaten path, but let's say Sisse in second seat. <laughs> <laughs> and sure. uh, Najila in third seat. Sure. So you have two proactive focus decks, one creature combo deck. Yep. Um, looking at a first seven here, I would snap keep this. Oh, God, I love seeing Vamp Tutor in the opening hand. Love seeing Sol Ring even yeah, more. Yeah, very, very We got good. a Dark Ritual. But I mean, oh, the man. fact that... So good. Yeah, the, the fact that we can do this is kind of wild. On turn one, hold up the Vamp. I mean, that just works very, very effectively. Uh, let's give ourselves a slightly more challenging mulligan here. Same pod, same turn order. Yeah. How do you feel about that guy? Uh, that's, a, that's another... That's a fantastic hand. Fantastic hand. Um, yeah, I'm going... Are, are you playing Fish or are you playing Talion on turn one? Depends on my draw. So I'm going to see what the first draw is here, because obviously we keep this. Oh. Uh, it is a Mind Break Trap, so oh. now I'm holding up further interaction <laughs> for Rogsai. I start with Talion here. Yeah, 100%. Because then I can keep the round the Fish for much longer, more confidently. You're sacrificing some amount of card draw, for sure. But you are gaining a lot of advantage in mana and the potential for development in later turns. We are not a deck that's going to win quickly. We have to expect the game to go long. And sacrificing one turn of fish draws when we already will have Italian on board to maybe draw us a card or two anyway, I think is absolutely worth it in this position. This was, again, a snap keep mulligan, though. Let's look at one more. Same seed order, same positions. Uh, you have to throw that back. Ooh. Yeah, no land. Just missing the mana, but it's so close. <laughs> Uh, here's our second seven. Also, I don't like it either. Also going to six. We're going to six. Going to six here. I see a time twister, a bow masters, and a rhystic study. There are some matchups I keep this. No. This is not one of them. Nope. It's a no. There's no world I can keep this in this matchup. I need to have something to stop them or develop myself. Oof. We are on five, and we're getting riskier and riskier here. I mean, the good I, thing is we are holding up a force negation. I would keep this hand. And the reason I would keep this hand is because that demonic tutor gets us into uh, whatever we need. Uh, and we have counter magic to hold up in the meantime are we at six or five right now this is five yeah that's so the five the for five sure. that i'm keeping here yeah. i mean we can see how it plays out a little bit it's not a great so hand this is the five you choose not a great hand but you draw i for don't turn. know that i get a better four though so i, I think i keep this draw for turn that's Play out exotic orchard gives us all our colors here i mean there's a real chance that against an agila and rogsai we have to fire this off on turn on turn two yeah there is 
So I mean, I would actually, use the wins. I'd probably keep the fears. Yeah, I'd use the wins. And I pitch the wins. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of whatever they're doing. Go to our next turn here. Hope to draw something better. We didn't draw something better. So I mean, on this multi five, we're gonna be a little bit pants down here. Yeah, but we're definitely we're um, we're definitely DTing here for uh, a mana crypt. I think. Sure. The alternative is we could demonic tutor for uh, uh, like a mystic Ramara. I think I think yes. I think crypt is better. I think I think that there's so crypt lets us. I mean again, we can turn on the, the interaction fears. of the yeah. cycle. So we're we're accepting that we're because these are tapped because we cast demonic tutor. So it's an acceptance that we are pants down for this exact turn cycle, um, with the hope of better development and interaction later. Yep. So that's that's kind of the decision you're making right now. And also in this pod of Rog, Sai, Sese, and Najila, when I play Talion on turn three, I think I'm more likely to pick number one here to gain a little bit more rapid card advantage. Yes, that, that's fine. Yeah, I think I'm probably naming one. So that would be our turn three. We would have drawn one more card by then. Played our Talion, or I guess played our Talion. And then, yeah, maybe we draw two cards in the turn cycle. And Beautiful. now on the following turn, we're we'll, uh, hopefully this fierce keeps us alive if we survived that one turn. And now we're in much better shape. Untap, play a Mystic Remora, hang the fuck out. Yeah. <laughs> now we're good. We got the Mindbreak Trap. We got, now we're we good. got the Deadly Relic. We might even have Metamorphed like, for a One Ring or something at this point. Like We have a lot of options. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. But yeah, those are going to be our mulligans for the Italian deck tech. We hope these were helpful for you. Hopefully this was informative and you guys enjoyed it. And, you know, it, and we're going to continue doing these kind of deck techs. Obviously, this is the first one. But we're going to do our all of our decks that you know and love. Uh, we're going to do Ob. We're going to do Florian. We're going to do Kinnon. Uh, we're also going to start looking at some of the you know best pilots on decks that we don't play and bring them in and talk to them and do deck techs. Uh, I don't know how often we're going to do this. Maybe once a month probably something like that um because there's a lot of editing but uh, you know we're gonna <laughs> it should be uh hopefully a, a good time for you guys and if you like it please you know let us know give us some feedback yeah you know like subscribe all that kind of good stuff and uh max you want to take us out of our de first deck tech Thank you so much for listening to the first ever Colors Are a Crutch deck tech. Like Max said, please give us feedback. We would love to do more of these. We want to know what parts of it you enjoyed, what parts of it you did not enjoy. What did we miss? What do you want to hear more about? What aspects of deck building and deck techs do you want to know? So like, yeah, thank you so much. We are Colors Are a Crutch. My name is Max Sternberg, aka Wounded Satellite, aka Your Kindly Lord. And I was joined by my incredible, beautiful, wonderful co-host, Max P, the Italian man. Thank you so much. We'll see you guys next time.